Aloha. Aloha. Today, we're going to answer the question, what is the Mandela Effect? And here to help us is Cynthia Sue Larson. Cynthia is the best-selling author of six books, including Quantum Jumps and Reality Shifts. She helps people visualize and access a whole new world of possibilities. Cynthia hosts Living the Quantum Dream on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. She has been featured on Discovery Channel, The History Channel, Coast to Coast AM, and the BBC, and she has presented papers at the International Conferences on Science, Spirituality, and Consciousness. Since 1999, Cynthia has shared findings from scientific research in the fields of quantum physics, quantum biology, the placebo effect, positive psychology, sociology, and alternative medicine. Cynthia has results from her How Do You Shift Reality surveys, which she conducted in April 2000 and June 2013. These results document incidences of the most commonly experienced types of reality shifts and her Reality Shifters websites has compiled one of the most extensive collections of reality shift reports worldwide. Cynthia has a degree in physics from UC Berkeley, an MBA degree, and a doctorate of divinity. Cynthia reminds us to ask, in every situation, how good can it get? We're so happy to have her on the show today, so please welcome Cynthia Sue Larson. Aloha. You've tuned in to the Hawaii Healing Network, and I'm your host, Christina McDesey. This topic is mind blowing. Right. So the closer you are to something, the less likely you're going to notice anything changing. What these reality shifts and Mandela effects are then is that they are when we notice them, when we observe something that's either appearing or disappearing, transforming, like it's completely different with no explanation, or transporting, or it could be a change in the way we experience time. This does include spontaneous remission of disease. It includes things like uh, synchronicity. It's an extraordinary thing when you hear about uh, celebrities passing away and you've seen it on TV, you've read the New York Times article or what have you, you're, you're very fully informed of what's gone on. And then you see the whole thing happen again, like the next day, or maybe a few years later, or maybe many years later. And then you can start questioning your sanity, unless you're fortunate enough to have experienced this with someone else, which is how the term Mandela effect got created. A blogger named Fiona Broom was at a conference, and she was talking with a bunch of people who all t- together remembered the same impossible experience, this alternate history where Nelson Mandela had died while he was incarcerated. I remember that too. And then of course it includes things like products changing, books changing, movies changing, geography changing, anatomical changes, changes in our constellations in the sky. Is this a dimensional shift? Are we literally playing in someone else's view of what their reality is and then we shift back to our view and then maybe go into someone else's view of their reality? What's really going on? I like where you're going with that and that's a really great way to conceptualize it is to recognize that we're social creatures, we're social animals and we definitely have a shared sense of consensus reality a lot more than we recognize. By popularizing this Mandela effect and reality shifts We're putting out there the permission, really, that it's okay if sometimes you notice different history than what's officially accepted. That's a great way to get a comfortable feeling with it. Like, okay, I'm not going to lose my sanity completely (laughs) just because if I start noticing things changing, I'll probably be noticing things other people are noticing, too. I definitely like to look at the physics of this, the quantum logic, if you will, behind all of this. And the fact that these strange behaviors that I was starting to notice back in the 1990s when I started my Reality Shifters website, and I published the book Reality Shifts. I can show you the copy cover of it. There's um, a face, and the the pupil of the eye is the planet Earth, which is just indicating this whole sense of what we think we see that's out there is kind of in here too. And we, the observer, are very involved in the whole process of every experience that we think is so physically real. The so-called quantum realm, which used to be imagined to be the realm of the very, very small, the more it detail you get, the smaller the particles, and then you can get to the building blocks of reality. And that whole thing went haywire when the smallest building blocks turned out to sometimes be visible and sometimes be pure energy all over the place. 
So it wasn't the kind of building blocks the physicists were hoping for, <laughs> and nothing's been the same ever since. <laughs> it leads me to a question, CERN, and this idea of these atoms that are colliding. Some people have suggested that it was because of this, that suddenly this effect or this reality of this dimensional shifting occurs. What would you like to say about that? My knowledge of CERN is uh, I've been tracking it since they were building it. I used to live in Switzerland before that <laughs> they fired up the Large Hadron Collider. And then as far as knowing the, the physicists that do this kind of work, I was at the opening for the movie that was called Particle Fever. Yeah, so when I went to the premiere for this movie, I felt compelled to go through inspiration. In fact, I didn't want to go. It's one of those things, like, it's all going to be about particle physics. I don't like particle physics. That's not what I'm interested in. I like the quantum paradigm. My intuition just pushed me really hard, like, you got to go. So I go. One of my favorite physicists was there. Dr. Yasunori Nomura is this outside the box for sure like Rafael Busso, also at UC Berkeley. And those guys are involved in conceptualizing how can the quantum physics of the very small be correlated and connected somehow to the cosmological scale. And what they then propose are all kinds of amazing theories having to do with multiverses, string theory, you name it. Those guys are interesting. Those guys, I could believe, might actually be thinking like yeah let's let's open up something let's do something but they're good people and yeah. they're not going to be creating great evil because i've been tracking this phenomenon since the 90s way before the large hadron collider got fired up what's happening is our attention is being turned toward the quantum realm we're thinking about what could happen what could go wrong what could be happening as soon as you start putting your mind and your imagination in those directions you will start seeing it. That leads me yes. to another question. Is the mandala effect expanding in the conscious awareness as a whole, as a collective consciousness, or is it more that perhaps the hundredth monkey you know, idea and theory that I know it, you know it, so then other people are just going to pick up on it? What do you think about that? That's a good question. There definitely is a network effect, so I'd say there's a lot to be said for the hundredth monkey. We definitely, like I said, we're social animals. We share a social collective agreement on what reality is and then at the same time when any one of us is pushing the limits all the way to the boundary we're bringing that possibility to everyone as well so i'd say both are true because okay. the publicity that the mandela effect is getting has been really great they're yeah. including some of the reporters that are investigating are noticing weird things as well <laughs> So instead of just making fun of it, they might start out to do that, and then they could go home and notice a family photo has changed. Right. One of the reporters noticed that an old family photo is now different that was sitting on his family bookshelf, and how would anyone have changed such a thing? That leaves him with this question, like, wow, is this real? You mentioned so much that it's about our consciousness, what we're aware of when we watch this, then we're shifting the reality of it. To me, it seems like there's got to be a way that we could take advantage of this reality shift. If we are the center of our own universe, can we shift things to what we want and what we desire? Absolutely. In fact, that's what I love to inspire people with, because otherwise this can seem a little bit unsettling, especially if something like the Bible changes right. or <laughs> constellations change or geography, things that people had really felt like, well, at least the earth is going to stay the same. <laughs> like Maybe not. At least the Bible will stay in place. Maybe not. <laughs> you know? I think people can look these examples up if sure. they're curious. But as soon as you start noticing that anything can change, that's the beginning of inviting our imagination to explore elevated states of consciousness rather than going down. Because we can always go either way. You can go sure. up or you can go down. And I'm not putting down, down. I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, if you think in terms of let's have things be a little bit more joyful, a little bit more kind, a little bit more loving, then we know what that feels like. You know what it feels like to be included, to be cared for, to yeah. be loved, to be appreciated, to be respected. All these are good feelings. Sometimes we think we want things like fame or wealth, and then we might bite off more than we can chew and get involved with our shadow stuff. It, just get, it gets into psychology, actually. But oh, really? when you recognize we're energy beings, there's what you think with your head, which is where you can get in trouble, actually, because that's where you might buy into, I have to be super famous. If you go too far too fast, it could be a disaster. Or I have to be super rich. And then we've got stories like King Midas and everything he touches turns to gold and he can't have love in his life. And we see this theme in all of our movies and books. So we know this. We know there are some psychological issues that we should be working through before 
we bring on all the good stuff. Just getting clear with our mind and recognizing maybe it's better to let our heart run the show. Nice. Because what you wish for with all your heart, it becomes a spiritual path. And you have the science now from your career and from your work at Berkeley to prove it on a scientific level. So for all the science gurus out there, why does this work scientifically? They may not be happy with this because we don't have an absolute answer on that. Here's the reason. It's because we don't yet have an agreed upon quantum paradigm, which is the philosophy or the underlying foundational understanding of why quantum physics works the way it does. We have a multitude of conflicting interpretations of quantum physics. This is all fact and everyone that hears that will agree and there's no argument there. What some people want is, okay, well then explain it. You know, how can you be seeing the sorts of reality shifts you witness thing? I think we're getting closer to being able to put something together that is a workable quantum paradigm that maybe not everyone would agree with, but Certainly a lot of people might. This is my book, Quantum Jumps. I've also written a lot of papers, research papers on quantum logic and macroscopic quantum phenomena, that sort of thing. But this book is easier to read. Those papers are free. They're, you can find them on my website. This book, it elucidates some of the logic behind some of the interpretations that I really especially like. It gets into the holographic interpretation of quantum physics, which everything is connected is the idea with the hologram. And if you've ever seen a holograph picture, you might know that a piece of that hologram, if someone were to come along and shatter the image, every single fragment of that picture contains the whole. Wow. And we see that with our human bodies. Like you can give yourself the equivalent of a full body massage by massaging your ear. This has been studied by David Bohm from the physics side and Carl Pribram uh, from neurological side. And there's a great book on it called Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot, a physicist. So I I love that. Highly recommend it. When you bring in the, these multiverse ideas, it starts getting super exciting. And these, this is the work of the physicists I was mentioning earlier, including people like Dr. Yasunori Nomura at UC Berkeley, Dr. Rafael Busso also at UC Berkeley. And those two gentlemen have independently written similar papers about the many worlds of quantum physics is one and the same as the cosmological multiverse. So that gets you thinking, like, okay, if you take a look at all that and then realize maybe it's all unified. So instead of thinking of each of these as separate parallel universes, because parallel means parallel. Like if you've got two parallel papers, they sure. never touch. It's like two lines. But in a book, if it's all connected, it's like it got binding, then you've got the pages wow. connected. It's kind of like a different way of looking at it and recognizing, okay, so maybe... We are accessing these based on where we put our attention. So what we're looking for then becomes what we experience in many ways. When I tell you it's not complete scientifically, it's because we, as a scientific body of scientists, do not yet have a definition that's full and complete for what I am. We can't even measure consciousness. We can't tell you if it's created, destroyed, or predict its presence or absence. We don't know where to find it. <laughs> And so when we start involving consciousness and reality, which we haven't quite pinned down either, we're kind of getting to the big questions. The best I can do is to say, here's what I've been observing. Here's um, my body of research over the last 17, 18 years, complete with studies and uh, surveys of hundreds of participants talking about how they've experienced reality shifts. I've, I've written books about energy also. I've, I've got another book, Or Advantage, where I got into the science of energy fields. It's the most scientific book on the earth. A lot of people say that's hooey, but actually I don't think so because what I've noticed with reality shifts and Mandela effects, when you really need them, they tend to happen and they can happen on a big way. Wow. Like I described some examples in Quantum Jumps where a woman is in an emergency situation. She really needs to have basically a miracle and that happens for her. This happens for a lot of people. Everything from somehow miraculously voiding a, a car crash where there's no physical way that could have happened to miraculously healing from injuries, being teleported to safety. All of these sorts of things happen in real life, huh. life-threatening situations. And real life people from all walks of life can experience this. And when you feel like your gut is in line with your heart, is in line with your head, and there's no disagreement, then you can literally make that kind of quantum jump without actually knowing how you did it. The mechanism seems to be part of the way all of life operates. If I can visualize it, feel it in my head, and I work on this level here from my heart, maybe not my head so much as my heart, that then I will see the shifting around me? I mean, is it that simple? Can it be that 
ridiculously simple? It is pretty simple, but you also have to pay attention and have an open mind. Our beliefs can get in the way. And so for people that really don't think this can happen, it can be a bit more of a challenge. So I recommend they start reading firsthand reports, watch videos of people who are experiencing it. I've got uh, monthly publications of my Reality Shifters Easy that come out every month. And that's totally free. You can read through those. And what starts happening to the subconscious, at first it might say, that sounds impossible. (laughs) And then at some point... A sort of break, you know, you wear down that kind of resistance from inside, from that inner doubting Thomas in your own head, where it just keeps saying, like, that can't be true. Do your beliefs get in the way? I'm guessing you're saying, yeah, because if you believe something, you've already got an idea of what it's going to be. Yes. And so I recommend people start doubting everything. Okay. You know, be be a true skeptic, which means doubt even your own doubt. (laughs) Wow. I recommend that in my book, Reality Shifts, yes. because it really, it helps people get into this whole idea of, well, how do you know what's true and how can you, how can you tell what's real? I, I researched and found out that the native indigenous peoples here in the United States, including the Hopi Indians, basically believe that, you know, we're moving through different worlds and um, they talk about it. They say that things come true being hoped for. And that we're moving from, you know, the fifth world to the next world, you know, we're making this transition. And then when you notice the frequencies of the planet are changing, that totally fits. And it's not just the Hopi that believe this, the indigenous peoples the world over have a very shared sense of this transformation that's that's happening. Whether it's the aborigines in Australia, you know, they believe that it's it's all been kind of like, it's already truth that exists already in the yeah. dream time. And that we're just going through it the way you'd expect. The indigenous peoples like Mongolian shaman that I've talked to, you know, they have a similar view that we are energy and that we are engaged with the energy of the earth and all of the life forms on it. So I, I love the way the indigenous people see it. That's why I'm bringing this up. Yeah. And feel the energy of the earth. You can kind of get into that state of remembering that you too are an indigenous being you know you're indigenous to some place right even if you're kind of like a mix of different cultures you can get in touch with that feeling that this is your home this is your mother this planet earth and when as she is coming awake if you will and sharing more of that consciousness with all life forms on the planet because that's what it feels like when you're feeling that frequency it, it, it feels like it's raising the, through those levels we talked about that Ken Wilber discusses. And you, you get an access, a sense of being one with the earth and mm-hmm. that we can together, you know, get to a better place. And this has been foretold by many of the indigenous cultures okay, in a good way. I strongly suggest that anyone could take any course to get that connection into your heart. And like you said, to live from your heart and make decisions based on your heart. <laughs> I'm definitely interested in the Reality Shifters book, or the Quantum, well all of them. Because <laughs> you know? I've been watching your videos and I just, they're, it's so fascinating to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been such a joy. It has been. I hope <laughs> look forward to seeing Yes. Aloha. <laughs> the engineers so I know what you're talking about when you have the engineer mindset right and I'm the crazy artist and I'm like and they're just very straight laced they were my favorite people to hang out with I don't know why but they were on the surf team with me and so um you know so they had an opinion of me and I had an opinion of them but we got along well you know it worked out really good oh yeah it gives us all hope (laughs) yeah right yes when I was getting ready my phone just disappeared (laughs) It disappeared. Oh I couldn't find it. It wasn't anywhere I put it. <laughs> like, whatever, it'll show up. And it ended up being packed away in some books, uh, like folded in books and stuck in a corner. And I'm like, you know, I didn't do that. It's so funny because I remember I had it. And then all of a sudden there was that time shift or whatever, you know, we refer to as a reality shift. It just shifted in that. I don't remember any of that. And then all of a sudden the phone is gone. And then I come back and the phone is in the book. <laughs> so... I'm like, of course that would happen today before I'm going to talk to you on this interview. I'm like, thank you. Really. Yeah. Oh, so. I'm glad you remember that happened. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a fun one. <laughs> I'm glad it came back and it was okay. Yeah. I'm told, well, I needed it, obviously, to do this, so I'm glad it came back, too. So it was perfectly fine. I don't know. Can you see the phone from where you're sitting? No, you can't wait. It's no, not really. There it is. So there's the phone oh, filming there you live yeah. while I'm talking to you on Skype. 
while I'm answering questions on my talk about the smog right now, I am surrounded in it. So thank goodness I have my organite with me. That's good. Yeah. Makes it all work. Yeah. <laughs> Make it a lot